In the shadows of history, where echoes of the past linger like silent screams, lies a chapter of unimaginable sorrow and suffering. This is the story of a land once prosperous, now scarred by the ruthless hands of oppression. Welcome to the tale of colonial India, a saga of anguish and resilience, of tears shed and dreams shattered. Imagine, if you will, a time when the blood that runs in our veins today coursed through the hearts of our very ancestors. They were not mere figures from history books. They were us, living and breathing, dreaming of a better tomorrow under the sun-kissed skies of our beloved land. But their dreams were crushed, their hopes dashed against the rocks of British tyranny. How could a mere 20,000 Britishers trample over the lives of 300 million souls with such callous indifference? The answer lies in the dark annals of history, where the British Raj reigned supreme, blinded by power and intoxicated by wealth. The stark reality is that over 50 to 75 million Indians perished helplessly in British-induced famines, their cries for mercy drowned out by the clang of imperial greed. Once hailed as one of the richest lands on earth, India was mercilessly looted of an estimated $45 trillion of wealth, leaving its people destitute and desperate. As if this weren't enough, the life expectancy of Indians plummeted to a mere 40 years, a stark contrast to the 69 years enjoyed by their British counterparts. Illiteracy reigned supreme, with less than 16% of the population able to read or write, condemning generations to a life of ignorance and poverty, shackled by the chains of an unjust social hierarchy. Through the lens of history, we bear witness to the plight of our forefathers, the sons and daughters of India, whose blood flows in our veins. Their story is one of unimaginable hardship and unparalleled resilience, a testament to the human spirit in the face of insurmountable odds. How did the tides of history turn, leading us down a path where the blood of our ancestors was spilled and the cries of our people went unheard? How did we come to this, our motherland torn apart by greed and oppression? Our story begins around 3300 BC with the Indus Valley Civilization. These early settlers were not just skilled city builders, but also agricultural pioneers. Evidence from their pottery reveals their knowledge of cultivating wheat, barley, and even sesame. This early focus on agriculture laid the groundwork for future advancements. Fast forward a few thousand years, and we see the rise of powerful empires like the Mauryas and the Guptas. These empires understood the importance of water the lifeblood of agriculture. They built elaborate irrigation systems, some relying on gravity-fed canals, others utilizing ingenious underground channels. These innovations ensured a steady supply of water, even during dry seasons, and allowed for cultivation of a wider variety of crops, from lentils and cotton to sugarcane and spices. But it wasn't just grand infrastructure projects that fueled India's agricultural success. Our farmers were true innovators they developed a diverse range of tools perfectly suited to their land. The sturdy plow, pulled by oxen, tilled the soil. The sickle, with its curved blade, efficiently harvested the bounty. And the rahat, a unique lever system, used animal power to draw water from even the deepest wells. India's agricultural surplus wasn't just for sustenance, it fueled a vibrant trade network. Spices like pepper and cardamom, textiles woven from the finest cotton, and precious medicinal herbs. These were all exported across Asia, the Middle East, and even Europe. This international trade brought in wealth and further spurred agricultural development. Farmers, now aware of the demand for their produce, experimented with new crops and techniques, further increasing India's agricultural prowess. Around 3300 BC, Evidence suggests these early settlers weren't just adept at urban planning, they were pioneers in metalworking. Archaeological finds reveal they skillfully crafted objects from copper. A testament to their early grasp of metallurgy, the science of extracting metals from their ores. Fast forward a few millennia and the flames of innovation continue to burn bright. By the time of empires like the Mauryas and the Guptas, India had become a master of metalworking. Blacksmiths employed sophisticated techniques like smelting, where intense heat separated metal from rock. Molds were used to shape the molten metal into a dazzling array of objects, from weapons and armor for their mighty armies to intricate jewelry and exquisite statues adorning temples. 
The metalsmiths of India weren't just artisans, they were problem solvers. Iron, a tougher metal to work with, became a mainstay for weaponry and tools. Gold and silver, symbols of wealth and beauty, adorned royalty and graced religious ceremonies. But perhaps the most fascinating innovation was Wootz steel, an exceptionally strong and flexible metal prized throughout the world. The secret to its creation? A closely guarded technique, a testament to India's technological prowess. India's mastery of metals wasn't just for domestic use, it fueled a vibrant trade network. Wootz steel swords found their way to the battlefields of Arabia and Europe. Delicately crafted bronze sculptures and exquisite jewelry adorned palaces across Asia. This international trade brought immense wealth, allowing India to further develop its metallurgical expertise and experiment with new techniques. Knowledge was power in pre-colonial India. Metallurgical techniques weren't just passed down through generations of artisans. They were documented in meticulous detail. Ancient texts delved into the science of metalworking, detailing everything from ore identification to the construction of efficient furnaces. These texts ensured the preservation and advancement of India's metallurgical knowledge. Around 3300 BC, the Indus Valley Civilization laid the foundation for India's future as a trading powerhouse. Archaeological evidence suggests these early settlers weren't just skilled farmers, they were also pioneering merchants. Harappan ports like Lothal bustled with activity as they exchanged their wares, handcrafted pottery, beads, and even seashells, with communities across the Arabian Sea. This early spirit of trade, fueled by a natural advantage in geographical location, laid the groundwork for the vast networks that would define India's future. Fast forward a few millennia, and India's trade routes stretched like the veins of a mighty empire, connecting it to Asia, Africa, and even Europe. The Malabar and Coromandel coasts became thriving hubs, their ports echoing with the clamor of international trade. Powerful empires like the Mauryas and the Cholas actively invested in infrastructure, building magnificent ports like Mahabalipuram, maintaining well-maintained roads like the Grand Trunk Road, and even establishing merchant guilds to ensure fair practices and collective bargaining power. These robust trade networks allowed for a diverse flow of goods peppercorns, cardamom, and cloves, not just culinary delights, but also prized for their medicinal properties, fueled a global demand and brought immense wealth to India. Textiles woven from the finest Indian cotton and silk, renowned for their intricate designs and luxurious feel, Indian textiles adorned royalty and graced religious ceremonies worldwide. Precious stones like diamonds and sapphires, as well as ivory and pearls, added a touch of opulence to royal courts across the globe. Trade wasn't just about exchanging goods, it was a cultural exchange. Ideas, philosophies, and even artistic styles flowed freely along the trade routes. Indian spices not only added flavor to European kitchens, but also fueled scientific advancements in medicine. Indian textiles, adorned with intricate motifs inspired by Indian mythology, adorned royalty, and graced religious ceremonies worldwide. This cultural exchange fostered a sense of global interconnectedness, with India at its heart. Knowledge was key in pre-colonial India's trade success. Merchants weren't just hagglers. They were skilled mathematicians, adept at navigating complex currency systems like the gold hon and silver tanka, calculating profitable deals and managing risks. Ancient texts like the Yuktikalpataru delved into the intricacies of maritime trade, detailing everything from navigation techniques to insurance practices. These texts, along with established trade practices based on honesty and mutual respect, ensured the smooth functioning of India's vast trade networks. India's agricultural abundance provided the foundation for its prosperity. Metalwork, with its exquisite craftsmanship, not only bolstered its military, but also brought in significant wealth. And finally, trade and commerce, fueled by India's strategic location and coveted goods, cemented its position as a global economic powerhouse. Historians estimate that between the 1st and 17th centuries AD, India's share of global GDP ranged from a staggering one-third to one-quarter. This means India was not just wealthy, it was the wealthiest nation on earth for over two millennia. India, a land of vibrant colors, captivating cultures, and a rich tapestry of history. 
For centuries powerful empires held sway across the subcontinent, each leaving an indelible mark. Our story begins here, exploring the political landscape of pre-colonial India before delving into the dramatic fall of the Mughal Empire, an event that would pave the way for the rise of colonial ambitions. Imagine a kaleidoscope of power. In the 16th and 17th centuries, the Mughal Empire, at its zenith under emperors like Akbar and Shah Jahan, held vast swathes of India. Their magnificent courts, adorned with marble and inlaid with precious stones, were centers of art, literature, and intellectual discourse. However, the subcontinent wasn't a monolith. Other powerful players coexisted with the Mughals. In the Deccan Plateau, the Deccan Sultanates, like the Bijapur and Golconda kingdoms, flourished with their own rich cultural traditions and trade networks. In the south, the Vijayanagara Empire, though weakened by internal conflicts and external threats, continued to be a significant force. In the west, Rajput kingdoms like Miwar and Marwar fiercely guarded their independence, renowned for their martial prowess and chivalric code. Despite the political fragmentation, there was a degree of economic unity. Trade routes thrived, connecting the subcontinent to bustling markets across Asia and beyond. The Mughal Empire, with its well-developed administrative system, fostered a sense of relative peace and stability, further encouraging commerce. This intricate interplay of empires and kingdoms created a vibrant and dynamic pre-colonial India. However, by the late 17th century, cracks began to appear in the Mughal Empire's facade. A series of weak emperors, coupled with internal power struggles and rising regional ambitions, chipped away at the empire's foundation. The magnificent monuments, like the Taj Mahal, stood as testaments to a glorious past, but they also symbolized the vast resources that had been expended, leaving the treasury depleted. One of the most formidable challenges to Mughal authority came from the Marathas, a Hindu confederacy from the Deccan. Inspired by the guerrilla warfare tactics of Shivaji, a charismatic leader who carved out an independent Maratha kingdom, they disrupted Mughal supply lines and harassed their armies. Their swift cavalry and strategic use of mountain forts made them a thorn in the side of the Mughals, ultimately contributing to their decline. Religious differences also fueled dissent. The Sikhs, a faith founded by Guru Nanak in the 16th century, challenged Mughal orthodoxy. They faced persecution for their beliefs and their gurus often led armed resistance against the Mughal forces. The Sikh struggle for religious freedom would eventually culminate in the creation of a powerful independent kingdom in the 18th century. Even within the Mughal Empire, there were simmering tensions. The Rajput kingdoms of Rajasthan, known for their martial prowess and chivalric code, chaffed under Mughal control. Several Rajput rulers, like Rana Pratap Singh of Miwar, fiercely defended their independence engaging in long and bloody wars against the Mughal emperors. These rebellions weren't always isolated events. There were instances of alliances and coordination between different groups. Ambitious Mughal nobles, disillusioned with the central court, sometimes joined forces with rebels, further weakening the empire's grip. The complex political landscape of pre-colonial India saw these diverse groups, united by a common desire for autonomy, exploiting Mughal vulnerabilities. Imagine a land shrouded in mist, a tapestry woven with warring nobles, scattered fiefdoms, and a constant struggle for power. This wasn't a scene from a bygone era. This was Britain in the early Middle Ages, a far cry from the mighty empire it would become. Our story delves into the complexities of pre-centralized Britain, a time when the seeds of the future superpower were yet to be sown. Feudalism dominated British society. Lords held vast swathes of land, known as fiefs, granted to them by the king in exchange for military service and loyalty. These lords, in turn, divided their land further among lesser knights, creating a complex web of obligations and power struggles. The king, though the nominal head of state, often struggled to maintain control over these ambitious nobles. Power was fragmented, and the threat of rebellions loomed large. This internal strife hampered any sense of national unity or coordinated effort. The common people weren't spared either. Life for peasants was harsh and unforgiving. They toiled on the land, barely scraping by, and were at the mercy of their feudal lords. 
economic development was limited, and technological advancements were slow to take root. This feudal system, while offering a certain degree of stability, also stifled progress and innovation. However, glimmers of change were starting to appear. The seeds of intellectual curiosity and a yearning for a more centralized state were being sown. Scholars like Thomas Aquinas began questioning the absolute power of monarchs and advocating for a more just and ordered society. Economic factors also played a role in Britain's transformation. Trade with Europe, particularly with Flanders, started to flourish. Wool exports, for instance, brought in much-needed revenue and exposed Britain to new ideas and technologies. These commercial activities fostered a nascent sense of national identity, as merchants and traders saw themselves not just as subjects of their local lords, but as Britons. The dismantling of this feudal system wasn't an overnight event. It was a gradual process fueled by several factors. The signing of the Magna Carta in 1215, though initially aimed at limiting the king's power, ultimately established the principle of rule of law and chipped away at the absolute authority of the barons. The Tudor dynasty, with monarchs like Henry VII and Henry VIII, played a pivotal role in dismantling feudalism. They used various strategies, including weakening the power of the nobility through taxation and land confiscation, establishing a central bureaucracy to manage the kingdom, and building a strong standing army loyal to the crown. A centralized state offered several advantages for potential colonization. Firstly, it allowed for the efficient collection of taxes to fund exploration and military expeditions. Secondly, a unified foreign policy ensured a coordinated approach to dealing with other European powers and establishing colonies. Thirdly, a strong central government could mobilize resources and manpower for colonial ventures. Centuries of war and political turmoil had ravaged Britain, leaving a trail of destruction and hardship. But from the ashes of conflict rose a phoenix, a nation transformed by struggle. These very conflicts, far from being merely destructive, became the catalyst for advancements in military might, economic prowess, technological innovation, and a more robust political system, all crucial ingredients for the colonial ambitions that lay ahead. The Wars of the Roses, a brutal civil war that raged for decades, exposed the limitations of the feudal military. The Tudors, who emerged victorious, recognized this weakness. They established a standing army, equipped with standardized weaponry and trained in modern tactics. This professional force, combined with advancements in shipbuilding and naval technology, laid the foundation for the formidable Royal Navy that would dominate the seas in the coming centuries. Conflict also spurred economic growth. The need to finance wars led to the development of new taxation systems and a more efficient bureaucracy. The rivalry with Spain, a dominant maritime power, pushed Britain to explore new trade routes. This spirit of exploration opened lucrative markets in Asia and the Americas, bringing in wealth and fostering a thriving merchant class. London, strategically located on the Thames, emerged as a major center of international trade. Technological innovation wasn't left behind. The need for accurate navigation during exploration voyages fueled advancements in cartography and instrument making. Clockmaking flourished, leading to the development of more precise timekeeping tools, essential for naval navigation. The growing interest in science and mathematics, fostered by scholars like Roger Bacon, laid the groundwork for the scientific breakthroughs that would fuel the Industrial Revolution in the future. Even the political landscape underwent a transformation. Parliament, though initially a platform for the nobility, gradually included representatives from the commoners. While conflicts between the monarchy and parliament continued, the crucible of war fostered a sense of national identity that transcended class divisions. This evolving political system, with its checks and balances, provided a degree of stability and legitimacy to the emerging centralized state. The advancements weren't singular achievements, they were interconnected. Economic prosperity funded military expansion and technological innovation. Technological breakthroughs improved navigation, opening new trade routes and fueling further economic growth. This virtuous cycle propelled Britain towards the forefront of European powers by the late 16th century. By the reign of Elizabeth I, Britain stood transformed. The struggles and conflicts had forged a nation with a powerful military, a thriving economy, and a spirit of innovation. These advancements, coupled with a growing sense of national identity and a thirst for resources, paved the way for Britain's colonial ambitions. 
the fires of conflict had tempered a nation ready to project its power across the globe, and India, with its vast resources and fragmented political landscape, would soon become a target for this newfound ambition. For centuries, a lifeline throbbed between Europe and Asia, the Spice Route. This network of land and sea passages delivered treasures beyond imagination, cinnamon that warmed the soul, pepper that ignited taste buds, and silks that shimmered like captured rainbows. But in the 15th century, a storm of a different kind brewed on the horizon, the rise of the Ottoman Empire. Imagine Venice in the 14th and early 15th centuries, the city pulsed with the rhythm of trade, its canals teeming with ships laden with exotic goods from the east. Spices like pepper, cloves, and nutmeg, brought along the overland routes through the Middle East, were a source of immense wealth and power for Venetian merchants. These spices were not just culinary delights, they were essential for preserving food, treating ailments, and even fueling scientific advancements. However, this lucrative trade route faced a growing threat. The Ottoman Empire, a powerful Islamic state, was rapidly expanding its territory. In 1453, the Ottomans captured Constantinople, a critical link in the overland spice route. This strategic move effectively choked the flow of spices to Europe, sending shockwaves through the continent. European powers, heavily reliant on these spices, were desperate for a new solution. Enter Portugal, a nation on the cusp of maritime exploration. Faced with the Ottoman blockade, the Portuguese crown actively supported expeditions seeking a sea route directly to India. In 1498, Vasco da Gama, a daring explorer, defied the odds and successfully navigated around Africa, reaching India's Malabar coast, landing at Calicut. This groundbreaking voyage opened a new chapter in trade, the Age of Discovery. The Portuguese quickly established themselves as dominant players in the spice trade. They established trading posts along the Indian coast, controlling the flow of spices to Europe. Lisbon replaced Venice as the primary hub for spices, and European economies boomed. However, the Ottomans weren't about to give up without a fight. They contested Portuguese control in the Indian Ocean, leading to a series of naval battles. The struggle for control of the spice trade wasn't just an economic battle. It was a clash of empires. The Ottomans, with their vast resources and strategic location, challenged Portuguese dominance. While the Portuguese maintained a presence in the Indian Ocean for some time, their monopoly eventually waned. The Ottoman blockade, though disruptive in the short term, ultimately had a profound impact on global trade. It spurred European exploration, leading to the discovery of new sea routes and the Age of Discovery. The spice trade became more geographically dispersed, fostering competition and innovation. The Morin, already established in a lucrative trade network with Arab merchants, was cautious of the Portuguese. Da Gama's arrogance and rough treatment of local traders didn't help matters. He left Calicut empty-handed, but with a burning desire for revenge and a foothold in India. Here's where the story takes a fascinating turn. Not all Indian kings were averse to the Portuguese. Local players saw an opportunity. Goa, a rival of Calicut, saw the Portuguese as a potential counterweight to the Zamorans' dominance. Tamaya, a shrewd minister in Goa, saw a chance to weaken Calicut and secure Goa's position. He offered the Portuguese safe harbor and trading rights, a decision that would forever alter the course of Indian history. With Goa as their base, the Portuguese began to flex their military muscle. They used superior firepower to dominate the Arabian Sea, crippling Arab trade routes and establishing themselves as a force to be reckoned with. The Zamorin, alarmed by the Portuguese threat, tried to forge alliances with other kingdoms, but not everyone was willing to join him. Kochi, another Malabar kingdom, saw the Portuguese as a potential source of military support against Calicut. By the mid-16th century, the Portuguese had established a network of forts and trading posts along the Indian coast. Diu, Goa, and Daman became their bastions of power. Indian financiers and traders, eager to profit from the spice trade, readily collaborated with the Portuguese. However, the Portuguese conquest wasn't without resistance. Many Indian kingdoms fiercely opposed their dominance. The powerful Vijayanagara Empire, for example, clashed with the Portuguese on multiple occasions. The Portuguese presence in India was marked by brutality and exploitation. 
They often resorted to violence and intimidation to maintain control. The arrival of the Portuguese in India wasn't a simple story of invasion. It was a complex interplay of ambition, rivalry, and shifting alliances. Indian kings, traders, and warlords all played a part in shaping this pivotal chapter in history. The stage was now set for a long and tumultuous period of European colonialism in India. In Elizabethan England, spices were a status symbol and a source of immense wealth. But the journey to India, the source of these treasures, was long and perilous, controlled by powerful European and Asian middlemen. Enter the English East India Company, a group of ambitious merchants seeking a direct route to India and a cut of the spice trade profits. Armed with a royal charter from Queen Elizabeth I, sir, the company set sail for the East. Unlike the Portuguese who arrived with guns blazing, the East India Company initially took a more cautious approach. Their first attempts to establish trade with Mughal Emperor Jahangir were met with suspicion. However, through perseverance and diplomacy, the company secured a toehold in Surat, a major trading port in western India. They focused on building relationships with local merchants, offering competitive prices, and gradually integrating themselves into the existing trade networks. The Mughal Empire, then the dominant power in India, initially tolerated the company's presence. In exchange for customs duties and occasional gifts, the Mughals allowed the company to operate within their vast territory. As the company's fortunes grew, their ambitions did too. They began fortifying their trading posts, transforming them into fortified settlements like Madras, Chennai, and Bombay, Mumbai. This shift from pure trade to a more territorial presence caused unease among the Mughals. In 1686, Tensions escalated when the company refused to pay customs duties in Bengal. Mughal forces retaliated by attacking and seizing the company's main Bengal outpost, Fort William. This event, known as the Siege of Calcutta, marked a turning point. The East India Company realized brute force wouldn't work. They began bribing and manipulating Mughal officials to gain concessions and influence within the empire. The company also started building a private army, the Sepoys trained and equipped in European methods but recruited from among the local population. This growing military power allowed them to intervene in local conflicts, often siding with rivals of the Mughal Empire. By the mid-18th century, the Mughal Empire was a crumbling giant. The Nawabs of Bengal, once provincial governors, had become virtually independent rulers. Sir Robert Clive, a young and ambitious East India Company official, saw an opportunity. Clive, known for his cunning, exploited the growing discontent within the Nawab's court. He secretly met with Mir Jafar, promising him the throne and a hefty bribe in exchange for his betrayal during a potential conflict. Clive meticulously planned the upcoming battle. He knew the Nawab's army far outnumbered the British forces. However, he believed heavy monsoon rains would render the Nawab's gunpowder ineffective, giving the British a crucial advantage. On June 23, 1757, the Battle of Place unfolded on a rain-soaked battlefield near Place. Despite being outnumbered three to one, the British emerged victorious. The Nawab's forces were hampered by faulty gunpowder, and Mir Jafar's defection crippled his army. Clive's gamble had paid off. The new Nawab, indebted to the British, became a puppet ruler. The East India Company gained immense political and economic power in Bengal, laying the foundation for future territorial expansion. The aftermath of Place was far from peaceful. Mir Jafar, burdened by hefty payments to the company and facing resentment from his own people, struggled to maintain control. The East India Company, ever opportunistic, exploited this instability to further tighten its grip on Bengal. Public anger towards Mir Jafar's pro-British policies grew. The company, sensing an opportunity to replace a problematic puppet with a more compliant one, started fueling the flames of discontent. The company secretly contacted Mir Qasim, Mir Jafar's son-in-law, and a powerful military leader, offering him the throne in exchange for a hefty bribe and even more favorable trade concessions. In 1760, a rebellion led by Mir Qasim with covert British backing toppled Mir Jafar. The company believed they had installed a more pliable ruler. However, Mir Qasim, a shrewd politician, soon realized the extent of British control and dominance in Bengal's economy. 
Mir Qasim, determined to assert his control, imposed new trade regulations that restricted the company's privileges. This move enraged the British, who saw it as a direct challenge to their authority. In 1763, the simmering tensions boiled over. The Battle of Patna, a brutal conflict, saw the British emerge victorious once again. Mir Qasim was forced to flee, and the company's grip on Bengal became absolute. However, the company's ambition didn't stop at Bengal. They set their sights on further expansion. This alarmed the Mughal emperor, who saw the British as a growing threat to his own dwindling power. In 1764, a combined Mughal and Oud army, a powerful kingdom in Awad, challenged the British near Buxar. The Battle of Buxar, like Plassey, was a decisive victory for the British. Their superior military technology and tactics, coupled with the defection of a significant portion of the enemy forces, secured a resounding win. The Treaty of Allahabad, signed in the aftermath of Buxar, marked a turning point. The Mughal Empire was virtually shattered, and the East India Company emerged as the dominant political and military power in a large part of North India. Their ruthless pursuit of power, fueled by bribery, manipulation, and exploitation of internal conflicts, had paved the way for British dominance in the subcontinent. With Bengal firmly under their control, the East India Company's insatiable hunger for expansion turned towards southern India. Here, a formidable kingdom, Mysore, ruled by Der Ali, was rapidly growing in power and influence. Hyder Ali, a skilled military leader, recognized the growing threat posed by the British. He modernized his army, incorporating European weaponry and tactics, and established a network of alliances with other regional powers to counter British dominance. The British, ever the opportunists, employed their tried and tested methods. They exploited existing rivalries, bribing and manipulating disgruntled Maratha chieftains to join them against Mysore. The First Anglo-Mysore War proved to be a costly stalemate for the British. Hyder Ali's modernized army and strategic use of guerrilla tactics frustrated their attempts at a swift conquest. The uneasy peace was shattered when the French, traditional rivals of the British in India, entered the fray. Hyder Ali, seeking a powerful ally, forged a strategic alliance with the French to counter British ambitions. The Second Anglo-Mysore War proved to be a far greater challenge for the British. Hyder Ali's brilliance and the French alliance threatened to expel them from South India. Facing a potential defeat, the British resorted to exploiting internal succession struggles within Mysore, bribing and manipulating a faction to support a rival claimant to the throne. Hyder Ali's sudden death in 1782 left a void. However, his son, Tipu Sultan, proved to be a worthy successor. He crushed the British-backed rebellion and emerged as a formidable opponent. The Third Anglo-Mysore War saw Tipu Sultan unleash his revolutionary military inventions, including the Rocket Corps, which rained terror on British forces. Despite facing a technologically superior enemy, Tipu Sultan's tenacity and strategic brilliance made the war a costly endeavor for the British. The Third Anglo-Mysore War, though ultimately ending in a British victory, further cemented Tipu Sultan's reputation as a formidable adversary. The war also exposed the limitations of the company's military might and the high cost of protracted conflicts. The uneasy peace following the Third Anglo-Mysore War proved temporary. The British, ever opportunistic, set their sights on another powerful Indian entity, the Maratha Empire. The Marathas, a confederacy of Hindu warrior clans, dominated large parts of central India and posed a significant challenge to British expansion. The Maratha Empire, though formidable, was not a unified entity. Internal squabbles and a lack of central authority hampered their ability to present a united front against the British. The British, aware of these divisions, began a policy of exploiting these rivalries to their advantage. The British employed their well-honed tactics of bribery and manipulation. They offered disgruntled Maratha chieftains land, titles, and wealth in exchange for their support against their rivals and the weakening of the Maratha Confederacy. The First Anglo-Maratha War exposed the vulnerabilities of a divided Maratha Empire. The British, aided by some Maratha chieftains, emerged victorious acquiring vast swathes of Maratha territory and significantly weakening their military power. The British, through shrewd diplomacy, inserted themselves into the Maratha political landscape. They influenced the selection of Peshwas, 
effectively controlling the central authority of the Maratha Empire from within. However, not all Maratha leaders succumbed to British manipulation. Some, like the courageous Holkar clan, continued to resist British encroachment, leading to renewed conflict. The Second Anglo-Maratha War proved to be the final nail in the coffin of the Maratha Empire. The British, exploiting every opportunity and manipulating internal conflicts, emerged as the undisputed dominant power in India. The Anglo-Maratha Wars marked a turning point in British colonial expansion in India. The Marathas, once a formidable power, were decisively defeated. The British, through a combination of military might, political maneuvering, and exploiting internal divisions, had established themselves as the paramount power in India. Lord Dalhousie, the Governor General from 1848 to 1856, became the architect of this doctrine. It preyed on a loophole in the Indian succession system. Traditionally, rulers without a natural heir could adopt and successor. However, Dalhousie declared that in such cases, the kingdom would lapse, fall into the hands of the East India Company. This seemingly innocuous principle held immense power. It bypassed the legitimacy of adopted heirs and questioned the very right of Indian rulers to govern their lands. The doctrine wasn't a mere threat, it was a weapon unleashed. Satara, a Maratha kingdom, was the first to fall in 1848. Despite having an adopted heir, it was annexed on the grounds of lapse. Jhansi, ruled by the valiant Rani Lakshmi Bai, and Nagpur, under the Bonzal dynasty, met the same fate in 1854. The outrage was widespread. The doctrine undermined a deeply ingrained custom of adoption. Many rulers, especially those without biological sons, saw this as an existential threat to their lineage and their right to rule. But the doctrine of lapse wasn't just about bloodlines. It was a strategic masterstroke. The annexed states, like Satara, were strategically located, allowing the British to tighten their control over key regions. Jhansi, for instance, provided a crucial link between their northern and southern territories. However, the British weren't indiscriminate. Wealthy princely states like Hyderabad and Mysore, with their well-equipped armies, were left untouched. The British preferred to maintain a facade of legitimacy by keeping powerful allies on their side. The anger simmered. The doctrine of lapse was seen as a blatant land grab, a betrayal of trust. It fueled a growing discontent amongst the Indian populace and the nobility. The simmering discontent ignited on a sweltering May day in 1857. Sepoys, Indian soldiers serving in the British East India Company's army in Meerut, refused an order to use newly issued Enfield cartridges. Rumors swirled that the cartridges were greased with cow and pig fat, offensive to both Hindu and Muslim sepoys. The refusal escalated into open rebellion, marking the beginning of the sepoy mutiny. The rebellion spread like wildfire. Sepoys in Delhi, Agra, Kanpur and Lucknow mutinied, often joined by civilians and disgruntled rulers. Mughal Emperor Bahadur Shah Zafar II, a mere figurehead under British control, was declared the leader of the rebellion. The ensuing conflict was brutal. On both seeds, atrocities were committed. The rebels, though initially successful in capturing some cities, lacked a unified command and proper resources. The British, after recovering from the initial shock, brought in reinforcements and used their superior military might to slowly regain control. The fall of Delhi in September 1857 marked a turning point. Bahadur Shah Zafar II was captured and exiled, while the brutal recapture of Kanpur by General Henry Havelock became a symbol of British ruthlessness. The rebellion continued to flicker in pockets, but the momentum was lost. By 1858, the British had decisively crushed the rebellion. The East India Company, DMED unfit to govern, was dissolved. India was formally brought under the direct rule of the British Crown, marking the dawn of the British Raj, a period of direct colonial control that would last for nearly a century. India, a land blessed with fertile soil and brimming rivers, shouldn't have known famine. Yet, under British rule, it became a recurring nightmare. While droughts played a role, the blame goes far beyond the whims of nature. 
Brutal policies and a relentless focus on profit choked the lifeblood from the land, leaving millions to starve. The first major tragedy struck Bengal in 1770. The East India Company, then the de facto ruler, prioritized profits from opium exports over stockpiling grain. When monsoons failed, there wasn't enough food to feed the population. Millions perished, a stark illustration of the new order. The decades that followed were a grim waltz with hunger. British land revenue policies extracted a heavy tax from farmers, often pushing them into debt. Traditional, self-sufficient farming practices were disrupted in favor of cash crops like cotton and indigo, leaving less food for local consumption. The irony was stomach-churning. Even during famines, India witnessed a shocking phenomenon. Food exports continued. Rice and wheat, the very sustenance desperately needed by the people, were shipped out to meet British demands in Europe and to fill the coffers of British merchants. This wasn't out of ignorance. The British understood the situation. Viceroy Robert Litton, during the devastating 1876-78 famine, famously declared that famine prices would encourage a salutary diminution of population. Let's delve deeper. The British policy of laissez-faire economics, a belief in minimal government intervention, proved disastrous. They expected the market, even in a crisis, to regulate itself. This created a space for Indian traders and speculators to exploit the situation. Hoarding became rampant. As food prices skyrocketed, the very grain that could have saved lives became a commodity for the wealthy. The relief efforts themselves were riddled with problems. The British, initially hesitant to intervene, often relied on ineffective free market schemes or public works projects that paid meager wages in a time of desperate need. Transportation infrastructure, while being developed for British commercial interests, wasn't always readily available to move grain to famine-stricken areas. The Bengal Famine of 1943, the last major famine under British rule, serves as a horrifying example. Despite learning some lessons from previous famines, the British war effort took precedence. Food stocks were diverted, and essential imports like fertilizers were unavailable. Millions died while granaries overflowed in other parts of India. The famines of colonial India weren't just natural disasters, they were man-made tragedies. British policies and a thirst for profit created a perfect storm of hunger. It's a story not just of empty stomachs, but of a system that prioritized wealth over human life. India, a land of vibrant culture and abundant resources, became a feeding ground for the British Empire. But this wasn't a simple case of plundering gold and jewels. The British, with a cunning ruthlessness, devised a system of extracting wealth that squeezed the lifeblood out of the Indian economy, a system built on a foundation of crippling taxes. The most notorious of these was the land revenue. Unlike the traditional system where rulers took a share of the harvest, the British imposed a fixed cash tax. This meant even during droughts or crop failures, farmers had to cough up the same amount. The consequences were brutal. Millions were forced to borrow heavily at exorbitant interest rates, often losing their land when they couldn't repay. Villages were reduced to poverty, their self-sufficiency shattered. But land wasn't the only target. The British cast a wide net, levying taxes on everything imaginable. Salt, a basic necessity, became a luxury under a heavy salt tax. The British even established a monopoly on its production, squeezing every rupee possible from this essential good. Income, professions, even religious pilgrimages, all were subject to taxation. Often discriminatory, these taxes were levied more heavily on Indians than Europeans, a stark reminder of who held the power. The collection of these taxes was a brutal affair. British collectors, backed by armed force, descended upon villages like locusts. Crops, livestock, and even land were seized if payments were late. Homes were ransacked families torn apart. Resistance, however feeble, was met with harsh punishments, including imprisonment and public flogging. This wasn't just about immediate hardship. The tax system stifled economic growth. Farmers, burdened by debt and the constant threat of losing their land, had little incentive to invest in improving their fields or adopting new technologies. This choked off agricultural productivity and the Indian economy. Imagine you run a department store where the customer snatches your money and uses that to buy from your store. 
That, in essence, was the economic relationship between the British Raj and colonial India. The British didn't just exploit India through brutal taxes, they used that very wealth to buy up Indian goods at rock-bottom prices. Cotton, the kingpin of this colonial trade, was the lifeblood of British textile mills. India, with its fertile soil and skilled weavers, was the perfect source. But this wasn't a fair trade. British officials, backed by the muscle of the Raj, used a variety of tactics to coerce Indian producers. Advance payments, often at unfairly low rates, were forced upon cultivators, essentially binding them to sell their harvest to the British. Local officials manipulated market prices, ensuring a steady flow of cheap cotton to British coffers. This wasn't limited to cotton. From indigo, used to dye British fabrics, to opium, a lucrative export to China, the story was the same. Indian producers were left with meager profits, barely enough to survive, while British merchants and industrialists reaped the real rewards. The system didn't stop at manipulating prices. The British used a network of intermediaries, often Indian merchants, to do their dirty work. These intermediaries, while enjoying a cut of the profits, were ultimately beholden to the British Raj. They ensured a steady supply of goods, facing the brunt of British displeasure if quotas weren't met. The story doesn't end there. Indian ports became hubs for British shipping, another source of profit for the crown. Ships laden with Indian goods, bought with Indian taxes, sailed across the world, enriching British coffers further. Imagine a once proud blacksmith forced to sell his tools for a pittance. That's the story of India under British rule. The raw materials, extracted at a bargain price, fueled the roaring furnaces of Britain's industrial revolution, while India's own industries were systematically dismantled. Cheap cotton, indigo, jute. These weren't just commodities for the British. They were the building blocks of an empire. Factories in Britain hummed with activity, churning out textiles that would clothe the world. But the profits from these endeavors rarely trickled back to India. Indian farmers, burdened by taxes and forced to sell their crops at low prices, remained mired in poverty. The impact went beyond agriculture. India, before colonization, boasted a rich tapestry of industries. From textiles famed for their intricate designs to metalwork renowned for its craftsmanship, Indian artisans were admired globally. But under British rule, these industries faced a relentless assault. The British, fearing competition, imposed crippling tariffs on Indian exports. These exorbitant taxes made it nearly impossible for Indian goods to compete in the global market. Meanwhile, British-made textiles, produced with cheap Indian raw materials and benefiting from economies of scale, flooded the Indian market. The result? Indian mills, unable to compete with the sheer volume and lower prices, were forced to shut down. Skilled artisans, their livelihoods destroyed, were left jobless or forced into backbreaking agricultural labor. This wasn't just market forces at play, it was a deliberate strategy. The British, through a series of policies, actively discouraged Indian industrialization. Investments in infrastructural projects, like railways, primarily benefited the movement of raw materials to ports for export, not the development of domestic manufacturing. Education systems were geared towards producing clerks and administrators, not engineers and entrepreneurs. The consequences were devastating. India, once a vibrant hub of manufacturing, was reduced to a supplier of raw materials, a colony feeding the insatiable appetite of British industry. The skilled workforce that had built India's reputation for quality craftsmanship was decimated. The rich cultural heritage embodied in these traditional industries was on the verge of disappearing. But the story doesn't end there. The de-industrialization of India had a profound social impact. Millions were pushed into poverty. Their traditional way of life shattered. Cities that thrived on manufacturing became ghost towns. The wealth generated from India's resources fueled Britain's rise as an industrial powerhouse. But India itself remained locked in a cycle of underdevelopment. This wasn't lost on the Indian people. A growing sense of anger and resentment began to simmer. The exploitation, the destruction of their livelihoods, the blatant disregard for their heritage, all fueled a burgeoning nationalist movement. Indians, from all walks of life, began to demand an end to British rule and a return to self-determination. 